like there's no tomorrow. Hey! Hey! Hello, welcome everyone to the Financial Engineering Tours. Today is lecture number 12. Today we will discuss subjects associated with XVA in general. In particular, we focus on calculations of exposure uh, driven by multiple risk factors, uh, CVA, BCVA, and FVA. And the concept of XVA is very much important to the bank. Essentially, when you talk about XVA, you should always think of pricing of exotic derivatives. Therefore, we will use all the knowledge discussed and covered in this course. And now with opportunity, now is a chance where we apply all the topics like measure changes, filtrations, pricing of interest rate derivatives, a simulating of hybrid models, and so on. And today and next lecture, when we will talk about the value at risk, this is the two lectures where we apply all those subjects in order to uh, perform XV simulation and also evaluation of a value at risk. Um, let's take a look at the, the roadmap of this course. So this is a slide we have seen a few weeks uh, before. So this was the, the climb that we were about to take. So we started with lecture number one uh, with the base camp where we uh, introduced the content of this lecture. We went through the AJM framework, interest rates, construction of yield curve, and swaptions, mortgages, hybrid models. Then also we discussed the foreign exchange, uh, the market models like LIBOR market model. Today it's lecture number 12, so we, today we are discussing uh, XVA, the valuation adjustments. We still have one more lecture to go, then finally we will summarize the lecture where we conclude what we have learned in this very interesting uh, 14 lectures. Of course, this was much more materials than just the 14 lectures. We had many, many different blocks. So today uh, we, um, we have uh, uh, three blocks. So this lecture consists of three blocks. Today we will cover the uh, first three, so introduction and basics of CVA. Uh, here in particular, I'm putting CVA. In general, when we talk about uh, XVA, so it's X, but actually only the uh, A and VA, it is valuation adjustments. X stands for X, because in practice we, always, we have a CVA, DVA, FVA, and so on, then essentially this first letter is always chosen to be one of the letters of alphabet. So in generic general case, we have XVA. This means that you can substitute any letter for X, and that would be basically one of these adjustments, valuation adjustments we have to include in the valuation. Um, today we will have, of course, the introduction. I'll give you some motivation why it is so much important these days to include XVA in your valuation and what is the relation between XVA or CVA and risk neutral pricing. Then we go into the exposure calculations and uh, potential future exposures. So those are the measures that are used in evaluation of uh, XVA. And also those two measures are very important measures from the risk management perspective. Overall, uh, those two measures show you the potential losses uh, that could be or potential profits associated with future realizations of your portfolio. In this case, we can actually think of a value of our portfolio as a stochastic process, because value of the portfolio will be determined based on stochastic differential equations. So we have certain risk factors, and then portfolio will be evaluated on all of those paths, and it essentially makes our portfolio to be a stochastic process. And we will finish today's lecture with expected exposure. So we essentially, it would be a nice link between the two. Uh, next week, we will discuss this with block number two, when we concentrate on uh, some simplified cases, or let's say uh, the cases for which we are able to find expected exposures in closed form. So this means those methodologies, or let's say the simplistic cases, would allow you to double check your coding. So if you have implemented uh, expected exposures, you can actually check against analytical solution that will be provided here. So here we're we actually discussing a few examples, interest rate swaps, uh, FX uh, products, FX swaps, and also stocks. So using this, uh, let's say, closed form solutions, you can always verify whether your implementation worked correctly. Then we go for, a, for my, um, a Python implementation. So here we'll be discussing the particular example of a, a interest rate swap. So we will generate Monte Carlo uh, realizations, samples from the, uh, from the stochastic differential equations, and then based on those realizations, 
we will evaluate exposures for interest rate swap. And actually, this will be one D case in a sense that we have one risk factor. However, number of swaps, we actually consider two or even more, but you will be uh, able easily to introduce more swaps in the portfolio that we generate here. Uh, and then I will also introduce, explain how to extend the framework from, the, for, from section five and with also additional dimensions. This means in the previous lectures, we have learned about how to simulate interest rates, also FX, inflation, in stocks. At this point, I will explain how to include that in the generation of uh, uh, exposures from point 12.5. And then finally, today, to next time, we will finish with a CVA. So explain you what are the steps you have to take to arrive at the CVA formula. Um, the final block will be concentrated on uh, approximations for CVA. So what is the market industry practice on how to evaluate CVA? Then we go to the BCV. So this will be related on inclusion, not only a counterparty risk of default, but also we will include our own risk of default. Essentially, that's a problem associated with some kind of symmetry. If you assert, if you think that your counterparty can default, essentially that the value of derivative would de decrease. However, if your counterparty thinks the same about you, that you may default, that may lead you to mispricing. BCVA essentially addresses that symmetry point. Then we talk about we will talk about the FVA, the funding value adjustments, trade attributions in an XVA framework, and finally we will finish with a summary of the lecture in the framework. I have prepared two exercises uh, for this lecture. One exercise will be about building a portfolio consisting of multiple assets, like stocks, interest rates, and some options. And your second exercise, you actually will be uh, you will be asked to confirm numerically, whether the exposure calculation uh, using Monte Carlo will, uh, will agree with the close form solution for interest rate swaps. I think this is kind of very rich lecture. Today we have uh, three blocks again, and I think you will, it will be very insightful. We also have some uh, Python experiments. So I'm pretty sure you will, after this lecture, you will know a lot about XVA and you'll be able to implement your own prototype XVA engine based on multiple asset classes. Enjoy this lecture. Until now, we have discussed the case only when derivatives are priced under the risk neutral world or risk neutral measure. This means that derivative was only priced given arbitrage free assumptions and no risks like a counterparty credit risks were taken into account. So, for example, a risk that a counterparty may not be able to fulfill its obligations, that was not taken into account when expressing the price of a derivative. Uh, in the first part of this lecture, we will discuss the concept of the XV or CV in general, and what is the impact of this uh, probability, of how include the probability that a counterparty may not be able to fulfill its obligations, how to include that in the derivative pricing. So let's start with the, uh, of course, the part where we start with the introduction, a little bit of basics. What is the motivation and how to include, what is the idea behind the counterparty credit risk and how this will include it in the derivative pricing. So until now we have price, been pricing uh, different types of derivatives. So this is over whole course, we discussed different types of interest rate products, FX and also inflation that were bought and sold. And uh, we assumed that in a pricing equation, so once we discuss about the expectation under some measure, we never consider the case that one of the cash flows, there is a chance that the counterparty will not pay it. And of course, if we have additional risk that the counterparty will not pay a cash flow, that the payment that we expect to receive, that would need to be expressed in evalu evaluation of the trade. And of course, that also triggers the concept what is exactly the measure we should use this in the expectation. And that will be addressed in this, uh, uh, in this whole lecture. So as a start, let's start with a, a simple case where we have a, an interest rate swap. So as you remember, in an interest rate swap, we have, a, so this will be a time, we have a fixed cash flow. So this part is a fixed payments. And then we have, a, so we are paying fixed rate, and then we are receiving a float. So this is basically typical scenario. Of course, I'm making it because it's a floating. So this part of the float part, 
it's not determined uh, today. It will be those rates will be established. As you remember in the LIBOR, when we talk about LIBOR rates, those will be fixed in the future. So this is an example of the, the, the swap transaction. So we pay fixed rate, which is at every moment the same rate that we pay, and we receive uh, some floating part. And the value of a contract, of course, is the summation of those two legs. So we would have here, uh, we, uh, we pay, actually we uh, pay A, so it would be LIBOR minus, minus, this would be basically the structure of this trade. Uh, okay, so now we have, of course, this involves that our payment. So we pay fixed leg and we receive the float. Okay. And of course, the value of this contract today will be equal to the, this, the future cash flows discounted to today. And then we take expectation. So this is just the standard definition of the future cash flows. Okay, um, now let's imagine a situation that uh, a counterparty, A, has significant financial obligations towards counterparty B. So for example, in this case, imagine that we have here those float rates. So those are the rates that we're supposed to receive. Now market has moved. So initially the PV of the contract, so PV times T0, times T0 was zero because this is the construction how we have created the swap contract. So we choose the fixed rate K such way that the PV is equal to zero. However, after today, the rate has changed a lot. For example, inflation becomes much more significant. And then this means that the float, the yield curve has moved. And those float rates has increased significantly. So for example, instead of those rates, now those rates are much higher. For example, here. And so on. So of course, this means from our perspective, uh, we are on the winning side in some sense, because if we are just, uh, 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 our PV has increased because our obligations of paying, we are paying the fixed rate. However, we will receive the float, which has significantly increased. So our PV um, is positive. And of course, this means we already, in this moment, we could sell or so-called unwind the position, and that would give us a positive uh, performance in our trades because we have some contractual agreement with the counterparty that we will receive those future flows. Of course, if yield has moved upwards, this means that we will receive our um, trade as positive, positive PV. And of course, on the other hand, this also means that a counterparty, for example, has this exposure to the flow side because this is the amount that they will receive from the counterparty. But what if the counterparty, uh, because of the yield curve change, the move, their risks of a default probability has increased? So imagine scenario, a company that they are uh, paying a float rates and then the, basically the, the yield curve moves significantly and Although the company was not in great shape already, now the situation has worsened a lot because they have to finance their uh, their business with a rate which has significantly increased. This means that effectively their costs have increased, and this means that the probability of default of the counterparty has also increased because now they have to pay to finance uh, their um, their um, their job or their business. They have to get higher rate from the market. They have to. They have to pay more money return for this swap. So of course, this is this is very problematic because this means that on one side, we kind of gain because our PV has increased if the rates move up. On the other side, a counterparty has more chance of default. And this is also so-called wrong way risk when exposure increases also with the probability of a default of a counterparty. So, so for now, this is the this scenario, the rates have increased, but what to do about it? How to include this additional risk that the counterparty may default while our exposure has increased? So let's go back here. So um, now, of course, the rates have moved a lot, substantially, and counterparty A has significant financial obligations towards counterparty B, because, of course, these rates will need to be paid. Depending on the financial situation of the company, of the counterparty, it may, be, it may well be that the counterparty may encounter some financial difficulties to meet the payments. And of course, if you have, a, uh, of course, if you have fixed payments, then you know you can manage your costs effectively because you know exactly what you will be paying in the future. If you are having uh, payments, let's say for 30 years payments, and those payments are floating depending on market circumstances, of course, this means that those costs 
are not fixed. You cannot predetermine them. Of course, you could hedge if, for example, you would go to the market and you would buy a swap or sell the swap such that you would offset those risks. But if you haven't done it, this means you're running risk that market change may significantly affect your post profiles. Okay, what this also means is that counterparty B may encounter some financial losses. So if we are having this PV, which is positive, we are very happy, of course, about it. But if the counterparty A, so if the payment, if the counterpart that pays those floods is will default, that basically means that we are really running the risk that we will lose this, uh, um, we will lose this profit, potential hypothetical profit. Okay, and if uh, in practice, if the counterparty defaulted, the loss will be replacement cost. So of course, if we have this uh, swap, and we are, um, of course, imagine a scenario that we are not losing in this case. If we have those, let's say, future cash flows, you see the, the cash flows will happen at the same date. So we always have fixed part and we have a float part. And of course, those, uh, if we have, we are here, for example, in time, this point, then uh, we have paid the, the previous cash flow. So this bill doesn't really play any role. And the future cash flow, so if we are uh, counterparty would, at this moment in time, if a counterparty would not pay this amount, but we have paid this amount, of course, we will never continue with this trade. We will never continue with those payments on the fixed side. But we, however, we will lose this payment because counterparty will not pay this amount. So, of course, this means that uh, we are not we are not at risk of we are not at risk of losing all those uh, um, f let's say fixed profits or the fixed profits from this side because we are not going to pay this part. However, we may, we may lose the next payment that will happen. So if the counterparty will not pay at this period, of course, we will never continue the contract later because counterparty is not uh, worth to continue the business. But of course, this means that uh, we would need to uh, re, if this position, for example, was a hedge code position, we would need to uh, re-hedge uh, re in the market. And of course, if this PV was positive, uh, essentially, we are also losing this potential future profits that would also impact our potential uh, profits from the uh, from the from the from the market because if this would be for example 10 million based on the future expectations and the counterparty defaulted on this part of course we are not going to receive so we will need to re-enter the swap at if zero because we will just get a par swap uh, but then this means that the unrealized pnl so the part which we would we would expecting to get is not there so that will be also considered to be to be a loss Okay, in, in financial jargon, so now let's go to the little bit of, uh, um, we have, let's say, motivation, how this counterparty credit risk or how this default situation may occur. And now we have to bring it forward to the modeling side. But let's also bring it into the perspective of history, how these uh, risks uh, were exposed. And this is actually not so much long ago where market realized that including a risk that counterparty would need to be included in a, in a valuation. This is rather something uh, recent, especially from the perspective of the regulator. So in the past, when you were in a banking business, obviously you were taking into account some kind of additional premium to account for risk that counterparty were default. However, from uh, because of the financial crisis in 2007, 2008 and 2009, of course, now this is not anymore an option. This is a requirement. So financial institutions, they need to express show the risks also associated with those probabilities of default of counterparties. So it's not anymore uh, on a wish list or the, let's say good standard. Now it is a requirement by the regulator. So um, in financial jargon, the situation described above, so the situation when a counterparty doesn't meet its obligations, it's called CCR or we call it counterparty credit risks. So whenever you hear CCR, always think that there is a risk associated with a counterparty and credit part means default. Okay? So this is associated with a default part. CCR is, the, um, is related, so maybe it's not as proper, is, uh, is, re, uh, is related to the situation when the counterparty will default prior to the expiration of the contract and will not make all payments uh, required by the contract. So, um, so this is what we have seen in the example given above. As a consequence of the CCR uh, and its effect on the price of derivative, uh, 
we compute that uh, that our PV that we have seen. So because we calculated this PV at time t zero as just expected future cash flows, this means that uh, if we include this probability of default, that the contract essentially would be less worth less than more if compared to the risk neutral valuations. So if we have a chance that counterparty will not meet its obligations, the contract value is less than if the, that kind of probability would not be taken into account. So the uh, derivative contract with a defaultable uh, counterparty is worth less than a contract with a risk-free counterparty. So of course, that is just a, a consequence of the additional risk that needs to be included in a derivative price. And everything started in this, let's say, from the regulatory perspective in 2007, when the global crisis or the global recession uh, has occurred. Uh, and that, of course, initiated was United States with the credit and housing market and spread around the world. And of course, then from the financial world, it also spread to the real economy. Of course, if there is a, a turmoil in the financial markets, this means a lot of jobs will be destroyed, they will disappear from the market. That will have immediately the impact on the demand side and the purchasing power of people. Of course, that causes recession. And if the recession lasts long enough, that may be a depression period. Um, so, of course, the, 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 the important part from this crisis is that uh, everything, of course, there was a Baron Stearns that collapsed in, uh, in January, and there was also Lehman Brothers that collapsed in, I think, in October. So those institutions, financial institutions that failed, though those where you see that this Lehman was founded in 1850, those institutions had a great reputation that were building this reputation over hundreds of years. So that means that those institutions were very fundamental to the financial market. However, if you have a situation when, as a bank or financial institution, you have a, a contract with Lehman Brothers or other, let's say, a, a solid bank, however, you see that one of them, one of those fundamentals of the financial system collapses, then your perception of a default probabilities, or in this particular case, counterparty credit risk, is changing because then you see that even something that was considered to be risk-free becomes uh, a defaultable uh, product, defaultable contract that you may have with that counterparty. This means that those risks would need to be put it into account. And this is so, something that people when they didn't realize that the big banks as Lehman Brothers could fail and could not meet their obligations. So in the, in the worst times of the crisis, the bankruptcy of large financial institutions triggered a widespread propagation of a default risk for the financial world. So we had this systemic risk when the big institutions failed. And then if you are not certain that any of your counterparties would meet the obligations, sometimes, and actually this was also the case in the times of the financial crisis, financial institutions decided that better is not to do any transactions, better is just to keep your cash on your account. And that's the safest way to protect yourself. Especially in the times of, the, of Lehman Brothers, we didn't know, or the financial world didn't know uh, what banks, what financial institutions are intoxicated, uh, are toxic because of the connection to Lehman Brothers and because of the uh, sophistication of exotic derivatives, nobody really knew which bank or which financial, financial institution has the biggest exposure to those risks. Obviously, if you are not having not enough information to judge about the default risk, that would also imply that you are on the conservative side, you will not like to risk though your, let's say, investments by going into transactions with those counterparties. So you see, sometimes it may start with one financial institution and then this effect propagates over a whole financial system. And of course, this is something that uh, it's really not avoidable. Of course, the regulator tries to uh, mimic, or uh, not mimic, but minimize these risks by putting some capital constraints, restrictions, more transparencies. Of course, that is very, very helpful in the, in the long term. Um, and then, of course, after this uh, default risk propagation over the financial system, then um, the, the, the regulator stepped in and some methodologies and standards, how to measure risks, how to control your uh, derivative positions had to be uh, changed. The perception and also the risk measures applied need to be uh, 
um, reassessed. Uh, policies, rules and regulations in the financial world have changed dr dr drastically in the wake of that crisis. Of course, once uh, the regulator typically acts after the crisis, this is typically the, what we have seen over many, many years. Also, in this case, um, this was the case that the additional reserves need to be taken for exotic derivatives, more transparency included. This is, of course, positive. Of course, there is also a victim of these uh, regulations. And that, for example, uh, it is much more expensive these days for banks to be involved in exotic derivatives because of the capital requirements and also the amount, let's say, the, the, mm, the, the maintenance of exotic derivatives. It is considered to be high these days, especially because you need to do all sorts of uh, risk measures. You have to control your position continuously, but also you have to confront your model, your uh, devaluations against uh, alternative models. But this also means that exotic derivative is a derivative that you cannot simply sell easily in the market. Because it's exotic, you need to really find a counterparty that will be interested in that kind of trade. This also means that in times of a crisis where you have uh, less liquidity in the market, a uh, counterparty is not willing to really go into exotic or buy exotic derivatives. This also means that it's liquidity cost or uh, it is, has to be included somehow in the reserves. And of course, this means that exotic derivatives in this sense would need to be more expensive uh, as the market will be uh, liquid and uh, open for the trading of exotics. But this is also another thing that uh, affected, uh, affected the exotic derivatives. Of course, the biggest impact comes from the low rate environment that we already observed for many years. So you see that now it's a composition of the two. This means that exotics are less inter of interest. Uh, let's see how this develops if we have uh, uh, if we have higher interest rates. Then I think uh, the costs associated with uh, maintaining exotic models will be offset. Uh, will offset will be offset by the higher risk or higher interest rates that could be benefited from the from those exotic derivatives. On the other hand, from the financial engineer perspective. Uh, it is not only about looking into exotic derivatives. This is basically, let's say, nice, uh, of course, very exciting uh, part of financial engineering. But if we look at the XVA in general, XVA essentially requires all the toolings and all sorts of hybrid models that were typically used for the pricing of hybrid products or exotic products. And now these days, they have to be used for in usage for XVA. So CVA, BCVA, and so on. Uh, and this is also uh, very interesting from the financial engineering perspective, because we can use those models not only for pricing of exotics, but pricing of those CVAs, BCVAs, and other, um, other um, let's say, risk measures. So you see this uh, financial engineering and also exotics uh, enter the world via the regulator perspective, because now these days, calculations of expo exposures in a and those kind of risks I just mentioned, it is has to be, it's obligatory. So then you are um, doing the exotics, but not doing this for uh, exotic for exotic derivatives, but you do exotics for the risk management uh, and exit uh, for the banks. Okay, um, this is important part. So important area of financial risk is the required special intention referred to the CCR. This uh, is the risk that a party of financial contract will not be able to fill the payment duties and that are agreed upon the contract, which is not a default. So how to basically now, for, this is mentioned, uh, what I just mentioned, uh, the, the concept of inclusion of a default probabilities into pricing of derivatives, uh, it is actually making this derivative pricing uh, an exotic derivative pricing. So it's not anymore uh, risk neutral pricing and then uh, that's it. Uh, but actually those exotics are not used for pricing of exotics, but pricing of regular contracts. So you can see that actually after the financial crisis, a uh, simple plain vanilla swap that I have just uh, illustrated becomes an exotic derivative if we want to include also risks associated with probabilities of default and exposures. Uh, and we have uh, one more uh, slide for this block. Uh, since then, the probability of default of a counterparty, of the counterparty of a financial contract, has been incorporated in the pricing of financial derivatives, and thus plays important role in the pricing. Uh, 
This means that uh, simple products, if we want to include probability of default, they become uh, exotics. And we have to include this type of risk in derivative uh, pricing. Uh, counterparties are charged with additional premium. And this additional premium, so if we have a contract, this additional risk or premium that is put on a risk neutral pricing includes the probability of default, and which is added to the fair price of derivative. Uh, and this is, of course, this has to do with the probability of default. This way, the risk of the counterparty would miss payment. Uh, um, sorry. This way, the risk that the counterparty would miss its payment obligations is compensated to the other party in the contract. This means that if we include the risk of default in calculations, and then we discount with, them, with the proper uh, default probabilities, then the PV would represent also the fair value while we include the default probabilities of the counterparty. Uh, the total amount of trades is complex. The total uh, does risk financial derivatives are significantly reduced in the wake of the financial crisis. So this is something what I mentioned. The lack of confidence in the financial system may have resulted in a drastic reduction of complexity, simply because risk of basic financial products is easier to estimate and also keep the money in the pocket. Uh, so um, from the risk perspective, uh, it is much, although interest rate swaps are already now becoming exotic derivatives because we have to include those uh, risks uh, associated with default probabilities. And this is already, let's say, sophisticated enough. So simple products become exotics. And then if you look at the previously exotic derivatives, those become very unattractive from risk management perspective because those are involving additional costs associated with the uh, with reserves. And also, um, the maintenance of exotics is really um, costly. What is also important to think is that um, what we could do if we took look at the pricing of derivative, so we we, um, we could think of this uh, measure expectation, the expectation under the A measure, uh, but the, how this typically works, how this whole uh, process of taking, including default probabilities into pricing, uh, the market practice is that we perform the pricing of a derivative as we would do it before, so pricing under risk neutral world, and then what we do, we include additional charge. And this additional charge is called valuation adjustment. This is why we call it VA, valuation adjustment. And then we also have this X in front. Often people ask what this X means. And um, we may have different type of adjustments if we like to pump, uh, include let's say those uh, counterparty credit risks uh, into pricing. So we can, for example, have valuation adjustment, which is counterparty valuation adjustment, CVA. We also have a, a BCVA. So this is the, uh, the case where we have uh, uh, two counterparties, so us and also counterparties. Counterparty may default, CVA. We also, so this is evaluation adjustment, valuation adjustments. We also have funding valuation adjustments. We have capital valuation adjustments. You see, there are many letters in front of VA. This is why it's commonly it's just written as X. That X indicates you can put there a letter, and then you have to do proper valuation adjustments. As a first step, in order to achieve our ultimate goal of pricing CVA or evaluating CVA, BCVA, FVA, and so on, we have to define some building blocks. And building blocks will be associated with uh, our portfolio, so exposures, and also probabilities of default. So the first question might be the probabilities of default. So those are, um, if you have a big counterparty, those are implied, they can be calculated from credit default swap. So it's a financial derivative, which will expose you to the probability of default in the sense that you will receive, it's like a, you can think of an insurance uh, against some counterparty, and then those uh, insurance, from this insurance value, you can imply what is the probability of default of the counterpart. Of course, this only works in this case, those exotic derivatives or credit derivatives, credit default swaps, they only exist for very big companies, the question will be how to imply, how to calculate these uh, default probabilities for small counterparty. Imagine a small company somewhere in the Europe, in Europe, that they would like to um, that would like to have a, a contract with us. How to get this uh, 
uh, probability of default. So the technique that is often used in banks is that um, the probabilities or all sorts of CDSS or default swaps are, let's say, organized according to the, the area of uh, business. Uh, for example, one uh, CDS can be associated with an uh, industry of uh, metals, exploration, uh, financial derivative, financial products, and so on. So then financial uh, institutions, they typically develop a, a technique of mapping uh, your uh, company, even if it doesn't have a contract like CDSs, uh, to map to particular probability of default. In that way, you can always get an approximation for probabilities of default given a profile of the company. So if you have a company, you can always mimic, let's say, what this company does, how big is the company, how much money they have, and that way you can uh, map, let's say, market observable CDSs or probabilities of default to that particular company. In that way, you can get an approximation of those probabilities of default that they can use in evaluation of XV. So this is the first part. And the second part we will focus on, because this is the part which involves computations and portfolio evaluations, is the part which relies on the so, concept of exposures. So uh, in, in this course, we'll talk about positive and negative exposures that are both important uh, for XVA. Uh, but now we will start with positive exposure later and we'll show you how this negative exposure is also important. Uh, so first, um, this is the formula. So exposures at time t are defined as the maximum vt and then with zero. So this is like you can think of a call option with strike equal to zero. And then what is inside here under this maximum, we have a vt. And vt is a value of derivative at time t. So this is kind of a, it's very simple, right? It's just a call option. However, it's very, uh, it's not so simple. The problem is with t. Oh, not, not the problem, the whole idea of the, the, the instance of XVA lies in T. Because before, we, once we talk about the pricing of derivatives, we always had this uh, T0. So this was today. However, here, there is no T0. T is just a time. And this time will change from today until the maturity of the contract. So for today, we know that this value, so if you have some payoff at time T, we discount to today, we take the expectation under this filtration, we know that this expectation, if we have T0, it's not because this is just that we can calculate until today because this filtration will be also T0. So everything is easy. However, if this T, it is in future, then the filtration also is in the future. This means that after today, so if you look from the perspective of tomorrow, this quantity from today's perspective is stochastic. Tomorrow, it will be still deterministic, but today it's not. So if you think of a kind of process, Today we have the initial value, and then this value of VT actually changes, goes like this. So you see this VT, if we have time here, T, it will move stochastically. So actually what is interesting is that before we had a stochastic processes for stocks, for example, as T, we had stochastic processes for LIBOR, so stochastic process for stock, stochastic process for LIBOR, T, and so on. And now actually because of this filtration thing, our V becomes a stochastic process because it's a it's a function in time. And of course, at time t, uh, many uh, things which are under this expectation, they will be, of course, measurable with respect to that expectation. But this expectation could be, for example, equal to L uh, t, to simplicity, LIBOR at time t. And of course, LIBOR at time t is only known today. Later, it becomes stochastic because you see this filtration is important. So everything here, if we would have here t0, everything is easy. However, if it's not, then it's much more complicated. Then we are talking about uh, um, evaluation of the portfolio and as a stochastic process. So if we have the stochastic quantity VT, we have to put it into this maximum. The question could be why it's maximum, why not minimum? And this has to do with the fact that with this example that I have shown you a few slides earlier, we had this PNL, that the value of our contract was positive. And of course, if something is positive, this means this is the maximum we can lose. If it's negative, uh, we may not lose it because it's just a, a zero. But everything which is positive value, that's potentially exposed to the risk because that's the maximum amount of money we can lose if our counterparty would default. So if we have a, a two counterparties and two counterparties are, um, uh, and one of them uh, is, uh, uh, is defaulting, and there is big exposure, big PNL positive for the other counterparty, this is potentially whole loss. So if I have contract with you, 
and the contract value today from my perspective is 100 euros so you owe me 100 euros and you default then i just don't receive 100 euros so my exposure at that point is 100 euros so then you see it is zero there's a maximum of the positive amount so it's a positive amount of all those values transferred from you to me basically this is how you can think uh, of course it could be also on their side because there is a uh, a trick that if, for example, if you default, you don't owe me 100 euros. However, if you default and I owe you money, I would still have to transfer the, some this full amount. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of uh, interesting because this means that if a counterparty defaults, uh, you still are obliged to pay to the counterparty full amount that you owe. And what happens then? That that amount of money later will be distributed redistributed to all the debts. So you have also credit qualities uh, that if you are in a bondholder or you're a stockholder, depending on the quality of asset, you may receive some kind of a recovery rate. In this case, uh, actually, we can, in this case, of course, we don't talk about recoveries yet, but I will show you later how this recovery, how much money you can return, get in return. So this basically means that if uh, you have exposure to you 100 euro and you default it, if we are in a financial world, it means not that I will just completely get zero, but maybe some part of this 100 euros I can recover. This could happen, for example, that we will sell your properties, your uh, TV, your mobile phone, etc. And some part after collecting all those profits, all the money you have based on all the goods, for example, it could be offices and so on. Then I can receive some fraction of the full amount that I have lost. So typically that will be based on also some kind of estimation. Uh, in financial world, we typically associate this recovery loss, uh, recovery amount. It is kind of fixed parameter, is estimated based on the industries, and roughly it is the literature you can often find it's 40% often. This is how it's used in evaluation. Okay, so this is the, um, the exposure part. And this is the very, very important part. So this is actually, if you look from the uh, computational perspective, this evaluation here, this is the most expensive part. Because this one, of course, calculating of expectation for VT, which is a vector at time t, it's easy. However, here, this is, can be very uh, time consuming, very computationally expensive, especially because of this age. This can be portfolio involving also not only two trades, five trades, it could have millions of trades. And that means that we have to evaluate this on the risk factors at every time t. So you see, in every path possible scenario, we have to evaluate the portfolio. So this is, will be on at time, let's say, T. So every scenario, and then we uh, we take basically a distribution of this, and then distribution is used here. So this is extremely computationally, extremely expensive. Okay, uh, another measure. So this T becomes a stochastic quantity. And what we can also look at, it's so-called potential future exposure. So if we go back to this graph here, you see that uh, we have this expectation. So this expectation, this, uh, let's say, distribution of VT, we can also have here the, the distribution. Uh, actually, in here, it's not zero there, so keep in mind. It's on the positive side. We have, let's say, a distribution like this. And then what we can also say, if there are some paths also coming here, we can look at this uh, quantile here. So it's, it's a tail of the distribution. And that quantile will say, what is the maximum, or you can think of a maximum potential loss we could have. So here, of course, those are kind of, if we take average of it, it could be somewhere here. And potential future exposure tells you the, the potentially how much you can lose. So if you look at the tail of the distribution, that indicates the, the quantile. Of course, if you, are, you have a fat tail here, for example, there could be some observations very high up. And of course, the, the if we look at the quantile, which is defined this way, uh, it may be a little bit of misleading because you, if you have this distribution here, let's see here, if I have distribution and I'm looking here, uh, lost for this hour, let's say, in this case, the, here we have um, uh, our VT, so this will be our exposure. If we have a quantile, because the PFE is defined as the kind of worst case scenario exposure, which is not completely correct, but it's defined as the X and belonging to R, uh, such that the P, so this level of, uh, of PFE, is smaller or equal of the distribution. Essentially, it means that we are looking at this uh, point uh, here, X, such that here 
this will be amount of probability will be t. So it's integral from x to infinity of our density of uh, exposure of x, and then we have x dx uh, would be equal to p. This is how we should think of this graph. And of course, this this x is actually the PV, so this x is actually this quantity here. But of course, if we have uh, some cases where we have observations here or there, those are also possibly losses. So you see that by looking at the PFE, you have maybe a little bit of misleading uh, uh, indication because then we just look at the point where the bigger losses exist beyond this point, but there it still could be that some of the losses there could be, for example, bigger than the capitalization of your company. This is not really uh, the ideal measure. However, it is indicative of some, some, some sort of a risk measure. It is a risk measure. Uh, later in the follow-up course, we'll be discussing also var value at risk, which is very similar idea as here. Uh, and then um, expect, expected shortfall, where basically we don't look only at this particular point x, but we'll be looking at expectation of all those events that happen after this x, so all these realizations, and then you get maybe you get better measure of uh, risks. So this PFE potential future exposures, it is a quantile of our exposures that we estimate based on the value of a portfolio. So first, the value of a portfolio evaluate in future realizations, just like stochastic process, extremely complicated stochastic process and very expensive to evaluate. You calculate the uh, maximum of Vt at zero. Then here you would just do, this will be CDF, so this F is CDF with this E, and then you look at this uh, quantile, and this quantile tells you about uh, the tail, so to some extent tells you about the tail risk, where your tail um, is. Okay, um, next part, of course, is that uh, we in uh, once you impose your portfolio, it may consist of m a different type of threads. And of course, if you have a, uh, um, as a bank, you may have many, many counterparties, you have many, many portfolios. And of course, the question would be uh, how to aggregate those uh, trades together. Is it per um, client or is it per global for the bank? And there are actually differences. So first, the easiest, of course, if you have a, a counterparty level, also, for example, or maybe even the, the easiest is actually when you look at the contract level exposure. So this means you calculate exposure per contract. This is what we did. If I have one contract, contract, let's say, uh, swap with one counterparty, I just calculate the exposure and also, let's say, this correction or the adjustment, the premium, based on that contract. I don't take anything else into account. Uh, you can also do the counterparty level exposure. This means that you are actually not looking at only one trade, but you can also look at the, all the trades that we have with a counterparty, and that would be... Um, um, that basically we better representing the overall risk because, for example, we may have uh, some swaps with a counterparty where we pay, and we have maybe the new con new contract that comes one party wants to buy is the one when we receive. So obviously there will be some kind of netting effect that could reduce the additional uh, risk associated with the default of the counterparty. So then we would think of a counterparty level exposure. There is another one, for example, there is a net set exposure. This means that uh, uh, within the counterparty, some trades may be netted together and some trades may be not netted together. So this is also uh, additional, let's say, diving deep into the, the composition. But the, the main message here is that the netting of different contracts may depend on portfolio may depend on the counterparty and also may depend internally also on the net sets, on a particular uh, contract that you are by law obliged or allowed to net or you are not able to net. So this is the example here, the, the netting part. And of course, if we have a, a netting example is that if you have a, a, a summation of two exposures, that will be always smaller or equal to the um, to the sum of the exposures. So the maximum of x plus y is always smaller than sum of the maximums. Of course, this means that this is beneficial uh, for uh, risk management because netting basically means offsetting risks. It's the same concept as we think of uh, hedging. Hedging is basically buying offsetting contract such that the risks or the cash flows will be reduced by other, the other side. So this is basically a very similar idea here.
Uh, from the exposure perspective, we see that in order to reduce the risk to a counterparty, the concept of netting is very beneficial, of course it is. And often when you have a counterparty, you may slightly even adjust the contract such that the overall exposure to the counterparty uh, may be beneficial with respect to the charges that you have to include in your contract in order to um, compensate for the risks of default. So for example, if I have 10 contracts with counterparty, um, in which I'm, uh, the, the exposure is big. However, counterparty would like to buy another 11th contract that will reduce the exposure. Then essentially, counterparty would benefit from it because my exposure will reduce. This means that the charge I have to charge for the contract can be significantly lower. So overall, that could be very beneficial for the counterpart. Um, and then another point, this is uh, something I have already mentioned. Not all the trades can be used in netting the netting is only applicable to homogeneous trades that can be legally netted. So there are rules, and there are those rules you can find in ISDA, master agreement, that tell you uh, what contracts you can net together. Uh, not everything is netable, not everything would give you this kind of quality. Uh, you, you may be legally not allowed to put few contracts together in order to reduce the risks. And typically, you have some exotic trades that will be much more uh, difficult. Uh, those may be not even allowed to be netted if you talk about the uh, CVA. Then you have to evaluate per contract the exposures and also the, the charges. And then here's another small example. And this is a related also example to uh, recovery. So if a counterparty, you uh, basically you're supposed to receive some money from the counterparty and counterparty defaulted, that you may receive at the end some money back. Of course, the process, if you have a financial institution to uh, recover back, uh, to, to get money back, it may take quite some time. In the recent history, uh, there was a bank that uh, finally, after 20 some years of uh, uh, after the default, uh, then after the 20 years, they basically closed the process of the bankruptcy. So imagine how much time it takes for investors to receive their money. Of course, and then your money, you will get only a fraction of the money you, you're supposed to uh, receive. And also the time value of this uh, of the money is also decreasing it. So here we have an example with, a, um, the, let's say, to see benefits of netting, we have one deal with a value of 100. So this is, let's say, PV of 100. Second deal has a PV of minus 50. So then let's take a look what will be the benefits of netting if you put those contracts together in a case of a counterparty default. So let's see here. In the case of a counterparty default, the other party is obliged to pay the remaining financial obligations. In the case of positive trade value, the party would only obtain a certain percentage of the full amount. So this is also a legal rule that if you own to a party that will bankrupt, you are basically have to still to pay it. It's not that you can say, oh, this counterparty defaulted, so I can keep the money. This doesn't work as, as, as such. You still have to pay full amount uh, even if the counterparty officially announced a default. However, if you're about to receive, you only receive a fraction based on this recovery rate. And, and that's typically associated, this is estimated. Once the, the default happens, then let's say the legal part will start and then this rate will be established on those, let's say, uh, the legal uh, cases, how much money would be recovered. Of course, this recovery rate is uh, also associated with value of a company in terms of uh, buildings, infrastructure, uh, investments, technology, servers, computers, even chairs. Those are all the elements that will be sold, then can be uh, uh, used to sell it to recover the obligations of the company. Okay, so let's have a first scenario. So scenario without netting. So if we have $100, uh, 100 euro, uh, Benefit, so we have PV of positive. Let's assume we have a 40% recovery. So basically, this means we have a, a 40, we will receive only 40. And so this is 100 euro that we're supposed to receive from counterparty. Because of the default, we are only get 40% of it. It's 40. Uh, for the second deal, we were owning 50, uh, 50 euro. And of course, we still have to pay 50. There is no way out. We have to uh, pay full amount to the counterparty. This means overall, after the recovery from the 100 and paying 50, we have minus 10. So this is this is our cost of a counterparty that defaulted. Of course, if the counterparty will not default, we see 100 and minus 50, this means 50. 50 will be our profit. Now this profit moved to, from 50 to minus 10. And then scenario of netting. So here we see that 
we have 150, of course, we put them together. We have, a, that means 50. And then, because that's the amount that we would expect to have our P to a counterparty, and then we take 40% from the recovery rate from that 50, which means 20. So here, 50 changed to 20. Here, 50 changed to minus 10. So obviously, the benefits of nettings are, are very, very clear and better, better, very beneficial. Of course, like I said, it's not always allowed to net depending on type of contract you have. And of course, this net configuration, net sets, uh, that contracts can be bundled together. It's very specific also per counterparty and also this ISDA agreement. But here, I think you, you also, uh, it's very clear example how this should be handled. And this also means that this in this, in this evaluation, let's go out here, this expectation here, we also, this evaluation of this part, those, this page here, the portfolio of trades, this will need to be done either for net set, per counterparty, or the whole portfolio. So this is, this whatever you put there has to be legally uh, justified. So there is a legal justification what trades you can put together to get this net uh, netting effect, calculate value, calculate exposures. After the exposures are calculated, we can calculate potential future exposures based on the distributions or the realizations of our portfolio evaluated for every risk factor at every time t. But what we can also do, we can calculate the expected or discounted expected value of the exposures. So this is how it looks like. So we have EE, so it's expected exposures. So here in, uh, in under the expectation, we have uh, exposure profiles, which is defined here. So it's a positive exposures based on a portfolio at time t, which is maximum. And this is what we have seen. This is the expectation of our or discounted future cash flows discounted to time t. Take the maximum of this uh, uh, random variable. And then what we have to do, we have to bring uh, the value. So we have, before we had the part simulated paths, we are time t. And then we have to bring those you see two more paths let's generate here. Uh, then we have this value at time t. We have to bring it here to time t0. And this is what we do with uh, discounting. So we multiply with one over mt. And this mt is the money savings account. Because you can see actually here, this is, it looks very nice because we still um, expected exposure. You can consider just as a derivative. So we calculate the cash flow, the pay payoff at time t. We discount with the money savings account. And this happens under the risk neutral measure Q. And this quantity is equal to one. And now you see there's a difference. Now we actually have this filtration at time t zero. This was filtration at time t. So this quantity, what is, what is uh, happening here? So we have those paths for the exposures for every time t. And now we took expected exposure, essentially, then we check expected. So it's only one, it's a tick value, tick line, which represents the expected exposures. And then we have a second line, this is the potential future exposures based on this profile. So once we have, once we have generated uh, values, expected exposures, or exposures, we can calculate either uh, expected exposures, so E, or PFE, so the potential future exposures, based on the same uh, realizations, based on the same paths. And this can be done just uh, this way. And so what is important, why I'm mentioning here, is actually the expected exposures and also the exposures itself are very it's a, it's a fundamental part that's going to be used later in evaluations for XVA, for the, counter, uh, the counterparty value adjustment for BCV, so the bilateral uh, CVA. Uh, country value adjustment, funding value adjustment, and many other adjustments. So exposure is always the most important ingredient, besides, of course, for the probabilities of default, which also need to be included. Okay, so this is the, the, the process, so expected exposures and also potential future exposures based on uh, uh, exposure profiles. And now the summary. So also there's something interesting regarding the potential future exposures, how they can be, um, how they are, they can be computed actually slightly different what we have done so far. So first is that measures like potential future exposures and expected exposures, those already mentioned in uh, Basel II uh, uh, regulations for the financial industry. Uh, expected exposure represents the average of the 
leverage expected loss. So this is the simple interpretation uh, of that, of course. Expected loss is nothing, you cannot really, maybe it is to some extent inform, informative uh, when you think uh, what is the expected loss. But of course, as a risk manager, this is maybe only partial information that you're interested in because you like to see the worst case scenario. You're not only interested on average loss, but at the end, you're looking for the loss that is could be very damaging to the company. So you have to look also at different measures. And one of them is potential future exposures which represents more as a tail risk. It, it, like I already explained, this is not ideal measure because uh, potential future exposure represents only the point when the, the, the tail risk is remaining. So we can only see the tail part and potential future exposure tells you only where the point is, where the probability of losses can exceed your uh, uh, potential future exposure. So that's really, it tells you that you may have 95% uh, that the losses uh, below the PFE will be only, if they have 95% chance of occurring in terms of losses, but uh, only 5% those losses can be extremely large because PFE doesn't take into account size. Uh, later in next lecture we discuss, we will discuss in VAR and also these expected shortfalls where we'll be looking exactly how to look into this uh, tail risk and taking the expectations of the tail. So kind of, C var or the conditional var or expected shortfalls. So those are the names you typically used to name this kind of a way of measuring the risk in the tails. Okay, um, there's also a debate. This was ongoing debate for many years. Uh, how the PFE should be calculated? Whether potential future exposures are related actually should be based on the uh, Q measure or it should be done under the P measure. So if we go back here to this picture, you see here we have this uh, expected exposures, also this part. It is evaluated under Q measure. Yeah? So this is Q measure. This means that uh, those uh, parameters, that the yield curve, the parameters for full wide, everything was implied from the market. This is arbitrary free, risk neutral measure. The debate is whether it should be Q or P. This means that whether the risk factors used to evaluate the payoff should they be based on the market, so market implied model parameters, or we should uh, calibrate those risk factors based on historical data. So taking historical data, for example, for volatilities, historical data for your LIBOR rates, uh, and, and so on. So all these parameters you calibrate based on historical data, and then you generate paths for your exposures, then you calculate the uh, quantiles of your exposure. Of course, then you don't have any more uh, if you do that. So if your model calibration is based on uh, historical data, but it's not based on the market implied data like we normally do, then you have an expectation under measure P. Of course, this is not for expected exposure. It will be more on the part where we talk about, let's go back, where we talk here about the quantiles. To expect this exposure profile, there we take the valuation of our portfolio under measure P. This means that processes used to evaluate the exposure need to be under measure P. This means they have to be calibrated using some historical data. Of course, from the computational perspective, this implies that if you like to have expected exposures under measure Q at a pot and potential future exposures under measure P, we have to perform twice the simulation because before we could just reuse the evaluations, the exposures to get both expected exposures and potential future exposures. Now we will need to do actually step in between. We calculate uh, exposures under Q. We have to calculate also exposures under P and then take the uh, quantiles for P and and expectation for EE, so expected exposures. So this is um, something to keep in mind. Um, why, why this choice? Um, and this choice is typically driven by the fact that risk managers uh, would like also to take into account uh, the scenarios that happened in the past not only what market expects about the future, because if you calibrate market model parameters to the market today, we only calibrate to the expectation of market of future valuations of risk, risks, and also the shape of yield curve, uh, volatilities, and uh, all sorts of correlations. However, from the risk management perspective, it may be also good to take a look how those risks uh, behaved in the past. So for example, you could say, okay, we're calibrating to the last 200 days. Or for example, we can also be conservative. We would say, let's calibrate our model, so under measure P, but all to the period 
where the market was in crisis. So for example, period of 2008, 2009, where there was a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty, then you can calibrate your models for uh, exposures based on that, let's say, stress scenarios, and then you can evaluate your uh, exposures based on that. You can also, what you can also do is that instead of calibrating to the market data, you can specify scenarios, like for example, shape of a yield curve, volatilities, just by hand and consider them to be extreme scenario that, for example, you have calibrated based on some historical data. So all those possibilities exist, and this is a matter of, uh, let's say, choice of uh, a risk manager, what is the most adequate choice for the um, risk management. Yeah? Those risk measures and also the approaches, of course, those are important measures if we talk about risk management, if you talk about hedging, about limitations for the traders, what type of risks and how much of risks uh, they're allowed to be taken uh, while trading those derivatives.